It is easy to forget that the technology in your pocket right now is the result of decades of wild experiments, accidental discoveries, and risky moves by companies that sometimes paid off and sometimes failed miserably. Today we are going to take a massive journey through time to look at the specific devices that did it first. Before we dive into the history books, I have a question for you. What was the very first smartphone you ever owned and what is the one feature you missed from it? Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you enjoy tech videos like this, please hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a video. To understand where we are today, we have to go back to a time when the idea of a computer in your pocket sounded like science fiction. Most people assume the smartphone era began in 2007 with Steve Jobs, but the true ancestor of the modern smartphone actually arrived way back in 1994. This was the IBM Simon Personal Communicator. It is arguably the first device to combine a mobile phone and a PDA into one unit. It was massive, heavy and looked more like a brick than a phone, but it had a monochrome touchscreen that you could use with a stylus. It could send emails, receive faxes, and it even had a calendar and a sketch pad. The battery only lasted about an hour, but the IBM Simon laid the groundwork for everything that followed. It proved that a phone could be more than just a device for talking. While the IBM Simon introduced the concept of a smart device, the business world needed serious connectivity. The ability to browse the full internet was a distant dream, but the Nokia 9 9000 communicator, released in 1996, brought us one step closer. Opened up like a clamshell laptop, it revealed a full keyboard and a wide screen. It was a powerhouse for business users who needed to send faxes and emails on the go. It defined the mobile office long before BlackBerry became a household name. Before phones could become true multimedia devices, they had to escape the boring world of black and white displays. This is where the timeline gets colorful. While the Siemens S10 was technically the first phone with a color screen back in 1997, it only displayed four colors and was strictly textual. The real revolution came slightly later with the Ericsson T68. This was a massive leap forward as the first widely available mobile phone with a rich color screen that people actually wanted to buy. It was not the vibrant OLED panels we have today, but rather a simple 256 color display. Despite its limitations, the T68 was crucial because it made interacting with the phone feel engaging rather than just functional. There was a time when you needed a separate MP3 player. That changed with the Samsung SPHM100, also known as the Uproar. Released in 2000, this was the first mobile phone to have dedicated MP3 playback capabilities. It only had 64 megabytes of storage, which is laughable by today's standards, but at the time, being able to carry a dozen songs on your phone was mind-blowing. It signaled the beginning of the end for the Walkman and the iPod, even if we did not know it yet. Now that we had color screens to view images on, adding a camera was the logical next step. While the Kyocera VP210 visual phone was technically the first commercial video phone released in Japan in 1999, the phone that truly popularized the concept of taking photos to share was the Sharp JSH04, released in the year 2000. It had a tiny sensor on the back and a mirror next to it so you could frame yourself, effectively making it the grandfather of the selfie. The photos were pixelated and grainy, but it introduced the world to the concept of picture mail. This was was the birth of MMS and the very foundation of platforms like Instagram and Snapchat that would dominate our lives two decades later. With multimedia features expanding, the networks needed to catch up. The real revolution in mobile data came with the introduction of 3G. The first commercial 3G network launched in Japan, and phones like the NEC FOMA N2001 were among the first to utilize these faster speeds. This transition from 2G to 3G was critical because it transformed phones phones from simple communication devices into data consumption terminals, allowing for faster web browsing and media downloads. Now we need to talk about security because this is an area where history is often misremembered. Many people believe that the Motorola Atrix or the iPhone 5S was the first phone to feature a fingerprint reader. However, the credit actually goes to the Toshiba G500, which was released in 2007. This device was well ahead of its time, featuring a fingerprint sensor that allowed users to lock their device and secure their data long before it became an industry standard. While the implementation was a bit clunky compared to modern standards and required a swipe 
motion rather than a simple touch, the Toshiba G500 proved that biometric security belonged on a mobile device. It was a feature that felt like it came straight out of a spy movie. We cannot talk about firsts without addressing the form factor that dominates the world today, which is the slate with a large touchscreen. While Apple often gets the credit for this, the LG Prada actually beat the iPhone to market as the first phone with a capacitive touchscreen. Before the Prada, touchscreens were mostly resistive, meaning you had to press down hard with a fingernail or a stylus. The Prada used the electrical current from your finger, just like modern phones. However, the software on the Prada was clunky and lacked the intuitive flow that Apple eventually perfected. Speaking of Apple, the original iPhone launched in 2007 was obviously a massive milestone. It was not the first smartphone, but it was the first to nail the user interface. It brought us multi-touch gestures like pinch to zoom, which felt like magic at the time. It eliminated the physical keyboard, a move that Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer famously laughed at, but which ultimately proved to be the correct path. The iPhone created the template that every other manufacturer would eventually copy. However, the iPhone lacked one major thing at launch, which was third-party apps. That brings us to the true democratization of software. The launch of the App Store in 2008, followed closely by the Android market, changed everything. But we are here to talk about hardware firsts, so we must look at the T-Mobile G1, also known as the HTC Dream. This was the first commercially available phone to run the Android operating system. It had a sliding physical keyboard and a trackball, looking very different from the sleek Androids of today. Yet, it introduced the notification drawer, deep integration with Google services, and the openness that would allow Android to capture the majority of the global market. As the smartphone wars heated up, the focus shifted to raw performance and memory. In the early days, we measured RAM in megabytes, but the Samsung Galaxy S2 changed the game entirely. This legendary device was the first smartphone to pack a massive one gigabyte of RAM. At the time of its release, this seemed like overkill. People asked why a phone would ever need that much memory, but the Galaxy S2 proved them wrong by offering a smooth, multitasking experience that left competitors in the dust. It solidified Samsung's position as the king of Android specs and set a new baseline for what a flagship phone should be capable of handling. This hunger for power continued with the processor wars. The LG Optimus 2X holds the Guinness World Record for being the first smartphone with a dual-core processor. This marked the point where phone specifications started to rival desktop computers from just a few years prior. Suddenly, we were talking about gaming on our phones in a serious way. While hardware was getting faster, the way we unlocked our phones was also evolving. We mentioned the fingerprint sensor earlier, but facial recognition has its own history. The Galaxy Nexus, released in 2011, was the first phone to introduce face unlock on the Android platform. This was a feature baked into Android 4.0 Ice Cream Sandwich. It was a purely software-based solution using the front-facing camera. It was nowhere near as secure as modern systems, and you could famously trick it with a photograph of the owner, but it was the first time we saw the potential of unlocking a device just by looking at it. It felt futuristic and sparked a conversation about biometrics that continues to this day. Then came a moment that fundamentally changed the architecture of mobile computing. In 2013, Apple released the iPhone 5S, and while the Touch ID sensor grabbed the headlines, the real revolution was hidden inside the silicon. The iPhone 5S was the first smartphone to feature a 64-bit processor, the A7 chip. The rest of the industry was caught completely off guard. Qualcomm executives even called it a marketing gimmick at first, but they soon scrambled to catch up. The shift to 64-bit architecture allowed for desktop class performance and paved the way for the incredibly powerful chips we have today that can edit 4K video and run complex 3D games. Speaking of 4K video, that is another milestone we need to highlight. Today, recording in 4K is standard even on mid-range phones, but the very first phone to offer this capability was the Acer Liquid S2. Launched in 2013, it was a beast of a phone that allowed allowed creators to capture ultra-high definition footage right from their pockets. While the phone itself did not become a massive commercial success, the Acer Liquid S2 pushed the boundaries of mobile imaging and forced other manufacturers to upgrade their image signal processors to handle the massive data rates required for 4K recording. The camera wars eventually moved past just resolution and into the realm of multiple lenses. The HTC One M8 was a pioneer here, introducing a dual camera setup to capture depth information. But the real revolution in photography versatility came with the Huawei P20 Pro. This was the first smartphone to feature a triple camera setup. It combined a main sensor, a monochrome sensor for detail,
detail, and a telephoto lens for zoom. The P20 Pro also introduced the modern night mode that we know today, using AI to stabilize long exposure shots. It completely changed the expectation for mobile photography, proving that phones could genuinely rival professional cameras in low light and zoom versatility. We cannot discuss biometrics without returning to the evolution of face unlocking. While the Galaxy Nexus tried it with 2D software, Apple perfected the concept with the iPhone X. This device marked the first time we saw 3D face ID technology. It used a dot projector to map thousands of invisible points on the user's face, creating a secure, three-dimensional depth map that could not be fooled by a photo. The iPhone X also famously removed the home button and introduced the notch design, signaling a new era of gesture-based navigation and edge-to-edge -edge displays. Another major aesthetic shift happened with the war on bezels. For years, phones had thick foreheads and chins. The sharp Aquos crystal was a budget device that few people remember, but it was the first to feature a design that was almost entirely screen on three sides. It looked futuristic, placing the camera on the bottom chin to achieve the look. As we moved closer to the present day, manufacturers had to figure out where to put the front camera if the screen covered the whole face. We saw notches, hole punches, and even pop-up cameras like on the OnePlus 7 Pro. But the ZTE Axon 25G claimed the title of the first mass-produced smartphone with an under-display camera. The quality was not perfect, and you could see a weird square on the screen where the camera was hidden, but it was a necessary first step toward the seamless slabs of glass we have always dreamed of. Then came the screens that could bend. We spent years hearing rumors about foldable phones. Samsung was teasing the technology for a decade. However, out of nowhere, a relatively unknown company called Royole beat everyone to the punch. The Royole Flex Pi was the world's first commercial foldable smartphone. It was clunky, the software was terrible, and it felt like a prototype that was rushed to market just to claim the title of being first. But it worked. It proved that flexible displays could exist in a consumer product. This forced Samsung to accelerate the Galaxy Fold, and now foldable phones are becoming a legitimate category of their own. We also need to mention the refresh rate revolution. For the longest time, phone screens refreshed at 60 times per second. The Razer phone, marketed towards gamers, was the first to bring a 120 hertz refresh rate to a smartphone. It made scrolling and gaming look incredibly smooth. At first, people thought it was overkill, but once you use a high refresh rate screen, it is very painful to go back to a standard 60 hertz display. Now, this feature is standard on almost all flagship and even many mid-range devices. Let us not forget the removal of features, which is a trend in itself. The Moto Z series attempted to make modular phones mainstream, where you could snap on a projector or a better camera. While it ultimately failed, it was a brave attempt to change how we upgrade our devices. On the other hand, the removal of the headphone jack, popularized by the iPhone 7 but actually preceded by the Oppo R5, changed the audio landscape forever, pushing the entire world toward wireless earbuds. Another fascinating first is the integration of artificial intelligence directly into the processor. The Huawei Mate 10 Pro was the first smartphone to feature a dedicated neural processing unit, or NPU, within its chipset. This allowed the phone to process AI tasks tasks on the device rather than sending data to the cloud. It helped with scene recognition in the camera and battery optimization. Today, everything from Google Assistant to image processing relies heavily on these dedicated AI cores that Huawei pioneered. Finally, looking at the very recent history, we are seeing the integration of satellite connectivity. The Huawei Mate 50 Pro and the iPhone 14 series both introduced the ability to send emergency messages via satellite when there is no cellular signal. This is a feature that saves lives and marks the next frontier where our phones will keep us connected literally anywhere on the planet. It is incredible to look back at how we went from the brick like IBM Simon to foldable supercomputers connecting to satellites. Each of these devices was a risk that shaped the world we live in today. Now I want to hear from you. Which of these firsts do you think was the most important game changer? Drop a comment below with your thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, please smash that like button and subscribe for more tech history. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.